Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Pure Pathways. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli bismillah. So it's nice to be with you again. Remember last time we were together, we spoke about all the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Muhammad sallallahu to be a prophet. We said that when he was 38 years old, he started to have unique experiences and became a very reflective person. And on that very special night, Laylatul Qadr, which we know is one of the last 10 odd nights of Ramadan, he saw Angel Jibreel, who brought him the first revelation of the Quran, the first five ayat from Surat Al-Alaq, that's right. And at that time, the Prophet was 40 years old. When he climbed to the top of that mountain, he climbed as a non qarit But when he came down, he was a qarit and a Prophet. And we know that Jibreel alayhi salam continued to visit the Prophet for 23 years. And he brought down the Qur'an bit by bit, one piece at a time. So today, we're going to talk about a few things. Number one, why was the Qur'an revealed bit by bit instead of all at once, like all the other books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came before it? Number two, what is the significance of the cave and the way in which the revelation happened? Number three, what is the significance of the first ayah revealed? Why iqra? And number four, how were all those parts of the Qur'an collected together into one book. So the first question I'm going to ask you is this. Did you ever wonder why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the first ayah to be revealed in a cave, in the desert, to a man who couldn't read or write? I mean, why not come down in a castle to one of the kings of the Persian or the Roman empires, for example? It's not a coincidence that the Qur'an came down to a simple man in a simple place. And if you think about it, subhanAllah, whenever you're outside in nature, under the stars, it just reminds you of your creator. It connects you to him. So Islam had simple beginnings. And this teaches us that it's the message. It's the idea that's important. It's not the physical location that we should focus on. Islam doesn't focus on materialistic things. Islam is for everybody. It's not just for the rich or the powerful. Islam is something that everyone and anyone can relate to. It's, subhanAllah, when the Prophet was there in that cave, he had a direct communication between himself and his creator, between the heavens and the earth. And that's the miracle that we should focus on. Now, the second question I'm going to ask you is this. Why so harsh? I mean, you heard me describe the harsh way in which Jibreel alayhi salam commanded the Prophet to read, 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 and kept squeezing him over and over and scaring him. Weren't you wondering why was the revelation so harsh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have sent this message down to the Prophet in a much softer, much, lenient, much more lenient way, right? But first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really wanted the Prophet to have no doubt in his mind that this was a dream. Remember how he had been having dreams right before the revelation? So the, when the revelation happened, it physically shook him. And there would be no doubt in the Prophet Sallallahu mind that this was real. This was not a dream. This was really happening. Another thing is that this big event that happened was a way to show the Prophet that this is a big responsibility that's coming to him. I mean, he was going to have to face those Arabs who were so stuck on the traditions of their forefathers, who were so oppressive. You remember all the things that we talked about in pre-Islamic Arabia, right? The Qur'an was coming down to change the ways of these people. That is not something easy. The Prophet was going to have to face a lot of hardships. He went from being one of the most loved men in Mecca to being one of the most hated men in Mecca. And in Surah Al-Muzammid, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet sallallahu alayka qawlan thaqila that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to send down upon him heavy words. These were not to be taken lightly. And we know from reports of his wives and his companions that whenever Muhammad Sallallahu would receive revelation, he would sweat, even if it was a cold day. And even the Prophet Sallallahu himself said, never once did I receive a revelation without thinking that my soul had been torn from my body. This wasn't easy on him. Sometimes when Jibreel alayhi salam came to him when he was on his camel, the camel would physically go down from the weight of the Quran, the weight of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's words. And uh, Muhammad Sallallahu he describes that when he would receive revelation, it sounded like a loud sound, like a loud ringing. And he would close his eyes and he would lower his head when he received the revelation. Everyone around him could tell that new ayat were coming down to him just from his body language and the way that he acted. And we don't even appreciate the Qur'an for what it is. 
we talk while it's being read, we say that it's boring and we don't feel like reading it, we don't appreciate the heaviness of the words of our Creator. We don't recognize that this is the one who created us speaking to us. The next question I'm going to ask you is this. Did you ever wonder why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the first word to be revealed? Iqra. Why not pray, salli, for example, or sum, fast, or donate, or any kind of worship? So after the Quran came down, you have to think of it as like a new era. The days of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam, those days are over. Those were the days of depending on physical miracles. Those days are gone. Now the Quran is going to be the miracle itself, the words of our Creator Himself. And we're going to talk more about the miracles in the Quran in the upcoming episodes, inshallah. But Iqra, read, meant that the days of ignorance were over. The days of knowledge are here. And there are so many ayat in the Quran that encourage us to seek knowledge. There are ayat that tell you, look around you, look at the creation, think. Remember going back to tafakkur, thinking about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking about your existence, it's all connected. So the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the pen. And that's even mentioned in Surah Al-Alaq. Al-Alaq, the one who taught us with the pen. So you can't even worship your Lord properly without knowledge. You have to have knowledge of how to pray. You have to have knowledge of how to fast. So iqra and worship, knowledge and worship, they go hand in hand. And I never noticed this before, but it's so cool. Surah Al-Alaq starts with the word iqra, right? Read. And it ends with كَلَّا لَا تُطِعْهُ وَاسْجُدْ وَاقْتَرِبْ So it ends in a sajda. It ends with, you know, an ayah that requires you to make sujood after it. So it's kind of like the surah starts with seeking knowledge and it ends with worship. So I, I thought that was really cool. So our religion teaches us that knowledge is power. And I know you hear this all the time and it's so cliche. But regardless of time, geography, culture, knowledge is always going to be what's going to make a civilization succeed. And Islam would relate to everyone till the end of time. You know, even as, as humans, we're always advancing technologically and medically, and there are all these scientific discoveries. But if you look at Islam, hundreds of years after the Quran was revealed, the Muslims are the ones who became the top leaders in civilization. For generations, people would travel from Europe and from Asia to the Muslim lands. They would come to Morocco, to Egypt. They would come to us, to the Muslims, to study medicine, to study math, astronomy, engineering, law. The very first university was created by Fatima al-Fahri, a Muslim woman in Morocco. The very first hospital was built by Muslims in Baghdad. Muslims discovered algebra, decimal fractions, different types of surgeries, surgical devices, the first windmill, the first type of guitar, al-oud, and one of my favorite things, coffee. Coffee came from Yemen, also in the Muslim world. Muhammad Sallallahu was the first one to ever use a toothbrush and miswak. That was the first of its kind to freshen breath and clean teeth. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of things that were invented in the Muslim world. But I also want you to think of the hundreds of thousands of books that were written. Books of tafsir, books of fiqh, books of sira, books of grammar. They're all written surrounding this one book, the Quran. And our scholars, they never finish studying the Quran, by the way. They're constantly studying it and discovering new things within it. Our deen has encouraged seeking knowledge from day one. From the very first ayah that was revealed, iqra. So the next question I'm going to ask you is this. What is the Quran comprised of? How many ayat are in it? How many suwar? How many ajza? Well, our Quran has 6,000 ayat put into 114 suwar and found in 30 ajza or 30 parts. And there are two different categories of suwar. You have the Mecca suwar and you have the Madani suwar. So how are those different from one another? Well, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi preached Islam for 23 years, right? The first 13 years took place in Mecca. So during that time, the Muslims were very weak. They were at the mercy of Quraysh. They were sometimes tortured by the Kuffar. The sword that came down during that time, in general, were shorter, and they dealt with morals like cheating and taking care of the orphan. And there were a lot of stories of previous nations, you know, showing showing people that this is what happened to the people before you who disbelieved in their prophet. So kind of like, look what happened to them. 
you don't want it to happen to you. Um, the Makki Suwar focused more on Tawheed, on how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Uh, the Makki Suwar encouraged people to look at the creation and think about their creator. Uh, the Makki Suwa taught about the Day of Judgment, you know, heaven and hell. So after that, Muhammad Sallallahu when he made the Hijrah to Medina, at this time, the Muslims were in a totally different situation. They were the ones who were in power. And for those remaining 10 years of the Prophet's life, the Prophet was a religious leader, he was a social leader, he was an economic leader. And the Suwa that came down in Medina now focused on something different. It focused more on laws laws of marriage, laws of divorce, military rules, things like that. Details of worship, details of salah, details of fasting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he changed the way that he spoke to the people. He changed the way he spoke to his audience based on their situation, based on their need, based on their level of knowledge. If you had a preschooler and you had an eighth grader, you would not speak to them in the same way. One has more knowledge than the other. And in this similar way, the Qur'an speaks to the people of Mecca differently than it speaks to the people of Medina. So we said that the Qur'an was not revealed all at once. So how much was revealed at a time? Well, the amount of ayat that came down varied from time to time. Sometimes Jibreel would just recite one verse and then leave. Sometimes he would recite a few verses. Sometimes a paragraph or two or an entire surah. Sometimes he would visit the Prophet once a day, sometimes more than once a day, sometimes once every few weeks or every few months. So the quantity and the frequency varied from time to time. So that explains how and how often the ayats came down. But what about the order? Did it come down in the order in which we see it today? Well, let's see. What's the very first surah that you find in the Quran? Surah Al-Fatiha. Is that the first surah that was revealed? No, we said it was Surah Al-Alaq. So the verses came down based on situations, and those are called Asbab al nuzul the reasons for revelation. For example, there were times when the Prophet ﷺ was going through tough times, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send verses down to console him, just to reassure him that he was on the right path and that he should remain strong. Sometimes the verses that came down would tell him the stories of the prophets before him who faced similar difficulties from their people. And it gave him a sense of brotherhood. It helped him get through the tough situation that he was going through. Sometimes verses came down to answer questions that people asked the prophet. For example, they asked him about the soul. They asked him about the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send down ayats giving him answers to those questions. There was a time when the people of Quraysh asked the Prophet ﷺ about Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave, which was a story that was known to the Christians of Medina at the time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Surah al-Kahf, uh, giving all the details of that story and correcting the misconceptions that the Christians had. Other times, the verses came down to tell people how to solve problems that they were facing in their community. Sometimes, the ayats came down to predict events that would happen in the future or to respond to events that occurred at the time. Okay, so now we know that the Qur'an was revealed gradually and was not revealed in the order in which we find it today. So, how was it brought together into one book? Well, the Qur'an was written down completely during Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's lifetime. He heard the ayat from Jibreel He memorized them instantly and never forgot them. And then he taught those ayat to the Sahaba who also memorized them and implemented what they had learned. Muhammad ﷺ told the Sahaba in which order they should place the ayat and the suwar. So the Prophet ﷺ gathered 24 Sahaba who could read and write, and he asked them to record the ayat for him, making sure that every ayah was being recorded accurately. And he chose his secretary, Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, to be the Sahabi in charge of this project. Okay, so where did the Sahaba write these ayat down? Well, Paper wasn't invented by the Chinese until many years later. So where did they write everything? Well, they used animal bones, stone tablets, leather, palm tree leaves, basically anything that was available to them. And if you went to different homes in Medina, you could find that every home had a few portions of the Quran recorded, but nobody had the entire Quran because the Quran was not compiled into one book yet. It wasn't put together into a book until after the Prophet ﷺ died. Why not? Well, simply because the revelation hadn't ended yet. 
The very last ayat that were revealed didn't come down until just days before the Prophet ﷺ's death. And so there was no way to put it into one book until the entire Qur'an had been revealed and the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. So what happened after the Prophet ﷺ died? Well, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the Prophet's best friend, he became Khalifa, which meant that now he was the leader of the Muslims. And during his rule, there were many hypocrites who challenged the teachings of Islam, mainly the faridah of paying the zakah. And about one year into his rule, Abu Bakr fought those hypocrites in the Battle of Yamama. During that battle, over 70 Huffad of the Qur'an died. Umar ibn Khattab, the Prophet's second closest friend, who later becomes the second Khalifa, he was worried that the preservation of the Qur'an was in danger. He was worried that if more Huffad died, then the Qur'an would be lost forever. So he convinced Abu Bakr Siddiq to collect all the recordings that the Prophet had approved during his lifetime and compile them into one book. So who did they choose for the job? Of course, none other than Zayd ibn Thabit, since he had been the Prophet Sallallahu choice. So Zayd uh, ibn Thabit, he took this responsibility very seriously. And what he did is he had dozens and dozens of Hufad check and recheck his work to make sure it was perfect. And the first full Qur'an was assembled. And you can find, you know, some of the earliest original copies of the Qur'an. Uh, if you go to Turkey, for example, in Istanbul, there's the Tukkapi Palace Museum, where you can see one of the original Masahif. So years later, when Uthman ibn Affan became the third Khalifa, what he did is he unified the handwriting, the script of the Qur'an, and he started sending copies of it to every major city. And along with each copy, he would send a Qari, somebody to read it to the people to make sure that they were reading the Qur'an properly. The Sahaba were so sincere and dedicated in their efforts to preserve the Qur'an. They made the effort, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who was responsible for preserving it. We can't ever forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself promised to preserve the Qur'an forever. No human will ever be allowed to change a word, a letter, or even a harakah from the Qur'an. And will never lose the ability to read the Qur'an in its original language. Think about Hajj. There are between 2 to 3 million people who attend Hajj at a time. Imagine when the Imam is reading Qur'an. When he makes a tiny mistake, even in a harakah, you have hundreds, maybe even thousands of Muslims, children included, who will catch that mistake, subhanAllah. The Qur'an is the only book in history that has survived unchanged for over 1400 years. And no group of people can say the same thing. Next time when we're together, we'll talk more about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. But before I leave you, I want to ask you to remember to subscribe, to like, and to send du'as my way. And I want to hear from you in the comment section. Tell us what your favorite surah is and tell us why. I hope to see you again soon. May all your pathways be pure. Assalamu alaikum.